Okay, welcome to Science Cafe, New Hampshire. Thank you all for being here. Tonight we're covering the topic of hearing, hearing loss, audiology, and cochlear implants. So there's a lot to cover there. So now first we have on our right Dr. Rachel Parkington, and she is an audiologist. And then we have three teachers of the deaf or hearing impaired, uh, Jennifer Morris, Diana Lindholm, and Francine Pelletier. And Francine is also a proud owner of a cochlear implant. Do I have that right? And our last panelist is a young man named Chris Gorglione. Gargone. Chris Gargone, who has both a cochlear implant and a hearing aid. So he has a different perspective on the problem. So I will let them give us a few minutes on their perspective of, uh, of hearing, and then we'll start the questions. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Parkington. I am an audiologist. Um, currently, I practice as an educational audiologist. So I go to schools in New Hampshire and work with the students that um, are deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, and work with their equipment that they use to help access the teacher's voice um, and occasionally help them with their hearing aids. Uh, I still do some clinical work uh, in the state. Um, this summer I'm working in Manchester, so I still do you know, formal hearing evaluations and fitting of hearing aids. Um, in, in my past, when I first started, I did much more of that uh, private practice work. So uh, lots of hearing aids, not many cochlear implants. I never was a cochlear implant audiologist, so I never fit or mapped cochlear implants, and we can talk about that, um, but hearing aids. So audiologists can wear a lot of different hats. Um, I mainly wear two of them, the clinical audiology and private practice hearing aids and working in the schools. My name is Jennifer Morris. I'm a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, as you may be able to tell, I'm not originally from hereabouts. Um, I am originally from Scotland and did my training in Scotland. Um, and I taught for about 10 years um, in a mainstream school that had a unit for students with hearing loss. Um, I moved over here and have kind of run the gamut of deaf education in New Hampshire. Um, I have worked for some organizations who helped um, write the guidelines for deaf and hard of hearing students in the state. Um, I've worked in early intervention and I now work with mainly school age children. Um, so I have around six districts that I work in. So I spend a lot of my time driving um, and then I go and I deliver direct services to those students. I also observe them in their classes and I provide a lot of consultation to staff within the schools um, alongside training and how to work with um, equipment and how to work with students who are deaf and hard of hearing. My name is Diana Lindholm and I'm a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing. I trained at Smith College um, and worked at Clark School for the Deaf, which is an auditory oral um, program. So the first question I get asked a lot is, do you know sign language? And in fact, I don't know a lot of sign language. Um, the technology today has given opportunities to deaf and hard of hearing children and adults um, that ha wasn't available before. So um, the majority of the kids that I work with um, do not sign and they use their hearing aids and their cochlear implants to access sound. When I graduated, I helped to open um, here in New Hampshire, which is a school preschool for deaf and hard of hearing children. And Christopher was one of my first students <laughs> at here in New Hampshire. And um, I worked there for 13 years. And um, then I worked out in mainstream, much like Jennifer does now, and 
seeing um, kids in the mainstream settings from three-year-olds up to high school kids helping their teachers and helping them use their hearing aids and their cochlear implants in school settings. Um, I also work with babies um, and now that children are identified with hearing loss when they're born, um, the families need some support to try and figure out what the next best steps are for their family um, and their deaf child. Now I do itinerant work in five different school districts in the southern part of the state and um, I work in early intervention in family homes um, now too. So I'm Francine Pelletier. My degree is from uh, University of Northern Colorado. At the time that I got my degree in deaf and hard of hearing, I was uh, hired to teach in a high school situation. So I was teaching junior high, high school, and sometimes signing faster than my students could read. And that was you know, pretty much the mode of communication, and most of it was ASL, American Sign Language for the Deaf. And um, from there, I ended up moving somehow or another, get transplanted, and I get out of here into New Hampshire. There wasn't a whole lot of need at the time for a teacher of the deaf, so I was kind of in and out of con continuing my education and staying in my field. And I would say I started with you know elementary kids, and then I was teaching kindergarten, and then I found out about early intervention. So for 14 years, I worked for that agency as a teacher of the deaf and working with and identifying children from zero to three. So the sooner we can find out that a child has a hearing loss, the greater the prospects of helping that child to have typical speech and providing them with the education that we've already talked about and the sports for the family and then strategies of how do you get kids to listen, use a hearing apparatus and make progress from a baby on and hopefully plant some seeds. So that was my job for 14 years. I'm now retired, and prior to that, I, um, let me go back and digress a little bit. When I moved out here, I found out uh, my hearing wasn't doing so very well. So even though I had the degree, I hadn't really had any hearing loss for myself or my family. And I found out that I had a mild hearing loss in my right ear, or my left ear. So, um, I had that checked out, found out that you know I had a hearing loss there, had the other ear checked out, and it ended up I have a sensory neural hearing loss. And it ended up to where I started and it went from one ear to two ears. I went from one aid to two aids, from two aids to do more powerful aids until there wasn't anything left to work with and a uh, cochlear implant became an option for me. So right now I have a obviously a severe profound loss in the right ear, which you have to have to get a cochlear implant, and I have a hearing aid in my left ear. Hey everyone, my name is Chris. I'm 20 years old and I'm currently a college student. I'm attending um, Rochester Institute of Technology, which also has the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. That's part of that college. So I went to that school and I was completely surrounded and immersed by other deaf people and some of them were not able to speak and they only signed, which was a little bit of a shock for me because I grew up speaking and I didn't know any sign language. So that really opened up my eyes to me. And in terms of my background, I was just, I was born deaf and I originally started out with two hearing aids, and then my left ear progressively got worse. So that's when I became a candidate for a cochlear implant. And I was implanted at the age of six. And I still have a hearing aid on my right ear. And I'm here now. I think I'll ask the first question, and I'd like the Dr. Parkington to maybe explain the basics. Tell us, how does hearing work? You know, w when everything's good, what happens? And then we can talk about how we lose our hearing or how we fix it. Basically have three parts to our ear. We have the outer ear, the part you can see, our ear canal, the part where we get earwax and all that goody stuff in there. So that's our outer ear, the pinna and the ear canal. We have the eardrum that separates the outer ear from the middle ear. Uh, how many of you have ever gotten um, an ear infection or fluid in your ears? Or maybe even needed tubes ever? Um, 
The middle ear is an air-filled space. And in that air-filled space are three tiny little bones. And they're actually the smallest bones in your body. And I, I brought these because I want you to see how tiny they are. They all fit actually on a dime. Um, but those three little bones uh, work together to um, push the sound. So the sounds, sorry, I got ahead of myself. The sounds collected by your outer ear, sent through that ear canal, hits the eardrum. The eardrum then hits the three little bones in your middle ear space. And those three bones work together to move the sound into your inner ear or your cochlea. All right? In that middle ear, I'll explain the, the ear infections and the fluid. If, um, you know, you're, have you ever heard of a tube? Your eustachian tube? So if your eustachian tube is not functioning properly and not opening and closing properly, your middle ear space can begin to get fluid inside of it. And if that fluid sits there, it can become infected, and hence you get an ear infection. And that fluid needs to go somewhere. So normally, you can get antibiotics. You can try to get that eustachian tube working again. If you can't get that to work, they'll put a tube in your eardrum, and that's how the fluid gets out. So we really want that middle ear space to, to be air filled. We don't want fluid in there. So that's when people say they have a, I get this a lot. I had inner ear infections. I had, it's, it's, a, it's an ear infection in your middle ear space. It's called otitis media, middle. So um, that's the middle ear. The inner ear consists of your cochlea. Um, it looks like a little seashell. It's really cool. Uh, it has three turns to it. And housed in that cochlea are uh, little hair cells. And those little hair cells pick up the sound vibrations that were sent from your outer ear, through your ear canal, hitting your eardrum, being passed through those middle ear bones, going to your hair cells. The hair cells pick up that mechanical energy, that mechanical sound, turn it into electrical energy, and then send it up the auditory nerve. Everyone following me? Yeah. Cool. So if you had an inner ear infection, you would have had something wrong with your cochlea and your hair cells probably wouldn't be very happy and most likely you wouldn't get your hearing back. So your inner ear, if you have an infection in your inner ear, that's a whole different story than an infection in your middle ear. So when you're looking or talking about the ear, you're talking about the three different sections, all right? And if you have certain hearing losses, we associate them with the three different sections. If you have a hearing loss due to earwax, you had something wrong with your outer ear. If you went swimming in lakes when you were younger and uh, the water got stuck and it might have gotten infected because it's been sitting in your, in your ear canal, that's an outer ear infection, otitis externa. Middle ear infections are when that fluid doesn't drain out of your eustachian tube. Um, you can also have a hearing loss due to those three little bones that are being passed around, those can start to fuse together um, and they won't send the sound energy sufficiently uh, to the cochlea. That can cause a hearing loss. You can have cholesteatomas or foreign bodies growing on those middle ear bones and then um, the sound isn't sent to your cochlea. So hearing loss in the middle ear could be a number of things. Hearing loss in the inner ear or your cochlea. You can have hearing loss in your inner ear or your cochlea due to genetics, due to birth, due to viruses that have maybe wiped out those hair cells. Um, noise exposure will harm those hair cells. So if those hair cells aren't looking like this and picking up that mechanical energy, but they're looking like this, they're not gonna send effectively, turn it into electrical energy and send it up to the auditory nerve to the brain. Uh, and that it could be a number of things of why that's happening. Um, I'm sure these two can talk to you about what, potentially why, uh, why they had the hearing loss and where the hearing loss was. When Fran said sensory neural hearing loss, that is usually the inner ear. Inner ear or auditory nerve. There's a term called conductive hearing loss. It's usually outer ear or middle ear. And then there's a term called mixed hearing loss, and that's a combination. Our first question down front here. 
I wasn't aware that you could have both a cochlear implant and a hearing aid. I thought it was one or the other, and that like a cochlear implant is like a different type of hearing, like a more kind of like bone inductive or something like that. Um, what's it like to have both forms of hearing? It's a unique situation. And you have to meet criteria to get the cochlear implant to begin with. So you have to have a severe, profound loss. A hearing aid is not going to provide you any input at all. When you get a cochlear implant, though, it destroys everything in that inner ear. So all those hair cells, whatever you have left that are functioning, in my case, there were very few. So um, putting a cochlear implant on that is like trying to find the best way to describe this. So pu putting those uh, filaments in there and you having the electrodes help to fire, and it gives you some of the mechanical sound that replicates what your normal ear would hear. So I liken it to a, a keyboard. Normal hearing, you hear all the white keys, you hear all the black keys. When you start losing your hearing, you might miss some of the white keys. For me, it was high frequency. So anything on the high key note of the keyboard, I'm not going to hear very well. But the bass sounds were fine. As my hearing prog loss progresses, the hearing aid will help turn up the volume. So if turning up the volume will help if you have a moderate or a small hearing loss. But if things need to be too, too loud, then you get distortion. So a hearing aid has limitations about what you can do. So a hearing aid might be able to fit in some of those white keys that I was missing. With a cochlear implant, what was happening, the hearing got worse and worse and worse until I couldn't hear the white keys, and now I don't hear the black keys. And then to the point when you have the ear cochlear implant, you don't hear any of the keys. Now my passion was music. So for me to use, lose that capacity with my ear was devastating. So good news was, as this ear got worse, I got the hearing aid. So the hearing aid gives me a more natural sound. And the audiologist helps to fine tune that to your hearing loss. And you can find something that's compatible so that you can pick up whatever. Now, I've got the biggest and the most modern, and this is the newest aid that just came out from uh, Phonak. And the reason I'm showing you, the body is huge. Technology today for a hearing aid can offer someone with, you know, a, a small, moderate, mild loss can benefit from a small aid. That's, that's tremendous. I can't get enough power out of that to take care of this year. So I've gone to a new one. This is a brand new Phonak. Just got it this week. I can't use an inner ear canal piece because it has to have so much power to, for this for me to benefit. How about you? My situation is a little bit different because I'm sure, do you remember like what normal hearing sounds like? What, what? Normal hearing sounds like? Like, because I was born deaf, oh, oh, so, oh. yeah, so it's hard for me to compare like what I used to hear right. and what I hear now. And I was also implanted at like such a young age, so I'm not really gonna remember what I heard on the hearing aid before I got the implant. Could you maybe speak about the bimodal aspect, about having one hearing aid and one cochlear implant? I think that was kind of part of what you were, how they work together. They don't work, like, in terms of, like, strictly machines, they don't, like, work together. But my brain kind of, like, puts it together. So my CI kind of captures the higher pitch sounds. And my hearing aid gets more of, like, the bass kind of sounds. But, and like together, and like because I have more higher pitch, and this is also stronger than compared to my hearing aid, so like I can't track sounds. So like anytime I try to find something, I always think it's coming from my left because it's more powerful. Different question on the CI. You were implanted at six. I don't know when the cochlea stops growing, but obviously the bones in your skull kept growing for a while. Did you need a second a replacement with a bigger size, or did the bones just go around it and you live with one for your whole life. I am actually not familiar with that in terms of how it, that works. Do you but you've had only one? You've never had a second implant? No. You only have one. Yeah, I only have one implant. 
how the implant works. Um, yeah, we have a visual. <laughs> so there's a surgical component um, and the piece that's actually inserted into the cochlea is an electrode array. So it's a tiny little filament that is pushed around that snail shell. Um, and then there's a small, um, like a hole in the skull that goes through there. But the, um, the part that, um, the magnet part is embedded in the skull just under the skin. So there's nothing that's really like going to be impacted by growth. They now implant here um, around 10 months babies are being implanted and that is not impacted by their growth at all. Um, what do teachers in a public school need to do to help a child with a cochlear implant? Um, as a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing with students with cochlear implants in mainstream classrooms, um, we work with the teachers to give them access to all sounds in the classroom, to the overhead they're called smart boards, the smart boards that they have in the classroom, the iPads that they have in the classroom, the computers that they have in the classroom, and the teacher's voice, most importantly, and their peers. So the children um, wear their cochlear implants to school, and they also have FM systems. They have tiny little receivers um, that attach to their cochlear implants, and the teacher wears a microphone, and the teacher wears it all day long, and they wear it when they're talking to the whole class, and they wear it when they're talking to the child individually or in a small group. And when they're not talking to the child, they mute that microphone. And the microphone helps to bring the teacher's voice this close to the child's ear, no matter where the teacher is in the classroom. So it cuts out background noise, and it cuts out um, you know, extraneous noise in the classroom. Christopher's used one for years, so I'm sure you can talk about how that helps you in the classroom. I had an FM system from first grade all the way up until I graduated in high school. And Overall, it helped a lot in terms of getting the clarity that I needed from the teacher's voice in order to do well in school. Um, the one thing is sometimes they forget to turn it off. <laughs> so I have heard them talk about other students and <laughs> go to the bathroom with it, and it's just... And then... It doesn't work that well outside, just because the acoustics, the acoustics are not that great outside. So like gym class, if we went outside, I would have to rely more on lip reading and more of the skills that I learned without the FM. But um, as for college, I don't use the FM anymore. I use what they have as a captionist. So what I get is like an iPad, and then there's a captionist that types everything that the teacher says. So I'll use that, or I'll use a sign language interpreter. So just to um, go back to the school situation, um, one of the big pieces that we do is training to staff. And the, the aim is that we would train all of the staff who may come in contact with the student in the school. And really just awareness raising, like we will let them listen to a simulation, if possible, of the exact hearing loss that the student has. Um, then have a simulation of how the FM system impacts them. Really just emphasising the areas that could be concerns for this student. One of the, the big things with the advent of the amazing technology that we have now is that we have students out there like Christopher who are doing so well that everyone forgets that they need to take these accommodations. Um, you know, I have various tales of, of students who there's maybe been a sub in the class and they've given the FM transmitter to the substitute teacher and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm loud enough. I don't need to use this. So, you know, we have to train staff. We also have to train the students to uh, politely <laughs> emphasize the need for that, that, the use of that technology. Um, but the training piece is massive and usually that ends with the kind of aha moment from the staff realizing how difficult it, it is and how much harder our students have to work to achieve the things that they do. 
can you get a little more detailed in how 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 we plug this thing into the brain? How do you actually physically do it? I mean, it's a miracle. Uh, that's the only way to describe it. It really is. I, I to this day, like my job was, you know, at risk. Um, I was evaluating children and doing testing, and I had to make a decision whether they're eligible for services for early intervention based on their degree in their responses. And I'm now missing the information. So it was like, I'm not going to be out of work. I can't be making life-changing decisions for little kids. My, this is my passion and my life. So it really got to the point to where I was in a desperate state. And I was willing to take whatever was out there as an option. So looking at a cochlear implant, because I was a teacher of the deaf and I'm going to workshops and I understand the three different makers and I understand how it works, it was not a leap of faith. It was, I have to do this for my own livelihood. And initially, you hear about when it's activated that you have a response immediately. You already have a sound coming into that ear that's been foreign. So high frequencies, because I've not heard high frequencies in that ear since probably my 30s, was really hard to hear. And the quality of the sound was tinny and robotic. And it was like, it, it was great because I could hear something that I'd never heard before. But it wasn't also, it, it wasn't really pleasant to start with. But then you're sitting there and they're turning on dials and you're doing sound checks and what you can hear and what you can't. And they start out very slow. And they do with little kids really slow. So you don't want to scare a child once they get implanted. If it's too loud and you do things too fast, the child's not going to want to have anything to do with it. So they wanted to go slow with me. I'm not a slow person. So I was there, and it was as soon as I was activated, we're going to come back in a week. I was calling them like two days later. I've already gone through my four maps. I need more volume. So I went back in. We up it again. Another week, I need more volume. And every time I would go back, it was making changes and fine-tuning. And I'm hearing things that I never knew made sound. Dishes clattering when you're putting them in the cupboard. Going to the bathroom, I didn't know it was so loud. <laughs> I, did. I heard a sound, and I couldn't figure out what it was. I thought maybe it was the refrigerator's motor. And, I'm, and now this is like a month after implant. And I'm going around the house trying to identify this sound. It sounded like it's outside. And I look outside, and I don't see anything. So I come back in. I'm in the kitchen. It's not in the kitchen. It's not in this room. It's not in that room. I come back outside. So I'm standing outside, and I'm looking around. And I look up, and the gentleman across the street is on top of his garage sweeping off the pine needles. I was hearing the broom across the street. Oh gosh. If you've had a hearing loss, you didn't it, it was it was like you didn't know whether to laugh or cry. You know, and I've had several of those moments. But it takes time. And it's really amazing because kids that haven't heard and had very little access to sound from birth if anything at all, and then if it gets progressively worse and you're totally deaf, it's a, it's a wonder that teachers can start out like Chris and get the information and the sound quality and the speech and the language. I mean, it's a credit to all the people, the teachers that work with that, to get them to the place that back in my day that didn't exist for the kids I worked with in high school. I had kids that went to Gallaudet who could not write papers. They could not write well because ASL was the language. And so you had to go to a special school. You had a special group of friends. You had a, um, people that were more like you, which is why the deaf culture, and I have to respect that as well. But it does create a big divide for kids now with hearing loss if you've got uh, a community that's a deaf community versus a hearing community and you're trying to figure out for this child the best best place for them. And also to answer your question, so the big the big miracle, which it actually really is, um, it's much different than a hearing aid. Uh, the mechanics of a hearing aid are very different from a cochlear implant. The hearing aid is really and basically taking the sound and making it louder. Now, 
I know hearing aids are expensive. And so they do a lot more than that. They're also trying to reduce noise and scout out your environment. But in a nutshell, we're making sound louder. Uh, cochlear implants are picking up the sound, sending it to the electrode array, and sending that signal to the brain. So it's a whole different way of hearing. And Fran, what they usually say is you have to relearn how to hear, which is basically what, what you were saying. You heard the broom. You're relearning how to hear. When you're fit with a hearing aid, you've had your hearing, um, and we're just making the sounds louder. Now, if you've had a hearing loss for 30 years, and then you put a hearing aid on, it's going to sound tinny and sharp and not that great, and it takes some time to get used to. Um, but a cochlear implant, you're hearing through the electrode array. We're wiping out your residual hearing and you're hearing through an electrode array and it's a completely different way to hear. So when babies are implanted or children are implanted or adults are implanted, that's where they need the oral rehab to start to learn or relearn how to hear effectively with this totally different device than what they were born with. And that's why we have these great teachers of the deaf right here to teach to teach people how to hear. I, I've seen, and I don't know if you can attest to this, but I've seen people that are implanted that don't work hard at relearning how to hear and they fail with their cochlear implant because it doesn't sound great. Um, so doing the work is important. Okay, question way here in the back. Thank you. You mentioned that it's, uh, it might sound robotic or you mentioned it might sound robotic or distorted at first. Is there any signal processing that goes on in the newer cochlear implants that can be adjusted to the preference of the, the new hearer? We're going to play a clip that's going to show you what a, a cochlear implant sounds like with different numbering of electrodes. And it kind of gives you an idea, um, and it's the best way that I know to try and give you guys an, an idea of what it's like to just have that uh, mm -hmm. cochlear implant response to sound. <clears throat> Again, this is a very short clip, but it will kind of give you an idea of what it sounds like with um, one channel electrode and then a four channel electrode, eight channel electrode, up to a 20 channel electrode. And you have 20, you have 22 right now. Yeah. yeah. Which is the standard. Right, we went from 300,000 hair cells in your cochlea to 20 electrodes. So let's let you listen to this. That's one channel. Four. What kind of bait do you use to catch salmon? Eight channel. What kind of bait do you use to catch salmon? 12 channels. What kind of bait do you use to catch salmon? 20 channels. What kind of bait do you use to catch salmon? In normal speech. So that kind of shows you a little bit how it sounds um, through a cochlear implant. And um, it's amazing that some of my students who have 20, 22 electrodes implanted, um, if one of them stops working, you think, oh, we're not going to have access to those sounds. But the clinical audiologist, the mapping audiologist, can allow them to have access to that sound on other electrodes. So it's really amazing technology. And as all um, computerized, so in that regard, they have that movement like Diana was talking about. One of the things that um, as teachers of the deaf we do is we um, do listening checks with our students and the sounds that we check for span the frequency range. And through doing that, we can pick up, for example, I had one of my students who um, started saying if instead of if. And it turned out that um, he needed his mapping adjusted and the programming was just slightly off and he wasn't hearing that F sound. Went to the audiologist, had that tuned up, good as new. Uh, those aspects are, are phenomenal, that they can be so fine-tuned. So if you're learning a language and you have a word that, um, that you're hearing 
and to that implanted ear is kind of a foreign word. But by practicing it and hearing it and using it in conversation, and you get to the point you know that word and you understand what that word is. So when you've had some residual hearing, you can make that link that much faster. So if you've got an ear that's picking up some sound, in my case, I have an, a hearing aid. So if I hear a new sound that comes into my cochlear implant, it's like I might not recognize it right away if it's just with the implant. If I put my hearing aid on, for example, I might get a better information from this song that I couldn't really understand what that song was. So I hear music, I know it's a male singer, I can maybe identify the kind of music, but I'm having a hard time knowing what song that is. When I put on my hearing aid, I get a more natural sound, and that's what the difference is in terms of using what residual hearing I have with the hearing aid along with this input that I'm getting, but I haven't identified it yet. Then once I get it, it's like, okay, now I know. Now the next time I hear it, then I'm going to know. Your, your brain learns all that information and stores it away. I think Diana mentioned um, how kids are being mainstreamed today into regular classrooms. I think about 15 years ago, I remember visiting a classroom in Manchester where it was just the deaf kids and they were being taught separately. So I'm wondering with all these incredible changes, is that now the norm that they're mainstreamed and there's not any of this separation? Here in New Hampshire, when we opened our doors oh, 19 years ago, um, we were a school for um, deaf and hard of hearing preschool children. And we did bring some typical kids in for language models since we were teaching them to listen and talk. Um, but at, you know, after 13 years, the school wasn't needed anymore because kids were being implanted and identified with a hearing loss when they were babies. Um, there are still some programs for the deaf um, in the country. In New Hampshire, there's uh, Manchester has a program for the deaf, and um, in Nashua, there's a program um, for um, for the deaf that um, it tries to integrate the kids into the mainstream as much as possible, um, but utilizes a lot of American Sign Language for the kids that are there. Some of them have cochlear implants, some of them um, don't. Some of them have just hearing aids, um, and in Manchester, the same thing. They use ASL. It, total communication is American Sign Language and spoken language together. So um, both of those programs are total communication programs. It sounds like being um, raised in Merrimack and integrated into the school system there, you were with a majority of hearing students. What has it been like for you in terms of the deaf culture at NTID? And, I know that at one time there was a very strong deaf culture there. So coming from your position of basically speaking and hearing almost forever, for as long as you can remember, what's that been like for you to go there? When I first initially went there, I thought the majority of deaf people heard and spoke like I did. But that notion was like completely wrong. So like I, when I first had like, my first exposure, I saw everyone's hands moving, and I had no idea what was going on. And there was only a few other oral deaf students. So I kind of hung out with them for a little bit. And then I had met some deaf people that knew sign language and spoke. So it was kind of those people where that's where I learned sign language. And then I also took ASL classes, so I can have like kind of a foundation of like what the set rules of ASL is. And so I took, so far, two ASL classes, and almost all of my friends are deaf. So that kind of really enabled me to learn sign language. And I actually really enjoy it because I'm able to kind of have both perspectives of deaf culture and um, being oral. Um, and there is, there still is some pushback from the deaf community about cochlear implants and how if you're born deaf, like, just, like, you're not supposed to do anything about it. But um, I think overall, I think the deaf community has kind of transformed and become a little bit more accepting as, like, the technology has, like, e evolved. And I think it's a good mix. I think SimCom, simultaneous communication, 
which is another name for speaking and signing at the same time, that's become more acceptable. Um, but overall, it was, I would say I really, I would have, like, culture shock when I first got exposed to that. But, like, now I'm fully integrated. So, like, I actually really like having both sides. I have a question. Curious, how do you diagnose in infants and newborns? How do you diagnose uh, hearing ability? So babies can't raise their hand when they hear the beeps. <laughs> It'd be right. so nice if they could. <laughs> so we can't do any behavioral testing on uh, infants. All babies are born, um, there's now newborn hearing screening. And uh, every baby's hearing should be screened, and they do that through something called uh, ABR, an auditory brainstem response, or OAEs, which are called otoacoustic emissions. And both both are evaluations where the um, the subject doesn't have to give us a response; they just have to kind of sit there and sleep. Um, for the ABR, we hook them up to electrodes, um, and they play clicks and they measure the, the brain's response to those clicks. Um, and we see uh, how soft we can get it, basically, um, to get a threshold for those kiddos. Uh, for newborn hearing screening, it's literally a, a pass-fail. Um, for otoacoustic emissions, you're playing uh, tunes into the ear, and then the ear actually gives you a response to those tunes. It's a magical, your ear is actually magical. That's why I became an audiologist. So uh, you get that response, and um, we look at the robust robustness of that response. And that's measuring your outer hair cells. So they're actually both measuring different parts of the ear. The auditory brainstem, is, uh, auditory brainstem response is um, looking at uh, the brain waves and all of the different parts of how the sound travels up to the brain and we're looking at the waves we get in the response to those sounds. The OAEs are a little more limited where they're just testing the hair cells, the outer hair cells. So we look at the response from the outer hair cells. I'd prefer hospitals to do both, uh, but um, I don't know New Ham I don't do New Hampshire newborn hearing screening, so. It's just ABRs. It's just ABRs, which still ABRs gives you more information than, than the otoacoustic emissions, so. But that's how we test them. When they're really little, and they're cute and they're six months. Um, you can do something called visual reinforcement audiometry, where you play sounds out of speakers and you try to get the kiddo to, their baby, to move their head to where the sound is. Um, and then you reinforce it with a picture, or it's usually like a moving, it's a little scary, it's like a moving stuffed animal, like the monkey with the. <laughs> but so you reinforce it and then you try to get responses for that. So you try to get some behavioral thresholds on them when they're older. I, I will say that it is amazing having watched um, audiologists work with really young children um, that it could be something as, as simple as they stop playing for a second. It could be that an eye glanced at the thing that's going to make the, the light and sound. Um, that really, um, if you have a young child who needs their hearing assessed, the importance of a pediatric audiologist is massive. And the fact that they'll usually have someone in the room with the parent and the young child as well to help with, with picking up all of those things as well. It's not just a one person um, and the baby in the booth with their parent. And when they, if they fail the ABR initially, then they're referred for diagnostic testing and for further testing for um, in, in a bigger hospital, most likely. Oh, and I guess that was another hat that I've worn in New Hampshire. <laughs> so there actually is someone in New Hampshire whose job it is to follow up on newborn screening. So if you have a baby and they referred, we don't talk about failed, we talk about referring. If they referred on their newborn screening, they will receive a phone call, a follow-up phone call from the, the coordinator um, to make sure that they've been hooked up with an audiologist who can do further testing and to check up how that went um, and to just make sure that they're being referred to the right places. And if there was a diagnosed hearing loss, that they're referred to early supports and services who would be able to provide them with in-home support. Well, he's looking for a question. Our goal is to get 
the baby diagnosed as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So kind of six months is what we're looking at. We like to get them diagnosed before, diagnosed and fit, three months, three months. Three months. sorry. More or less a statement. Um, just recently, a uh, number of the insurance companies have started picking up hearing aids and uh, they don't volunteer that information. You have to dig it out. You have to ask a lot of questions. And But I would encourage anyone that's uh, working with the hearing aids. I don't have uh, any experience with the cochlear implants, but the uh, hearing aids, they're paying 100% of very expensive ones. So go for them and yes. look into it. Yes. I, I Thank you for that. And I say when I'm in the clinic, their expense, you know, go get your hearing tested and talk to your hearing care provider about what your options are. Um, talk to your insurance. If you feel like you can't afford hearing aids, there's always a way. It, we work with a lot of kids and we almost always find a way. You know, it's, don't let anyone put up doors because hearing aids are great. They, and cochlear implants are great. Listen, they've changed people's lives. If you're walking around with a hearing loss, it's fixable. Um, there's always a way. The difference with the cochlear implant is medical insurances will pick that up because of the, a medical necessity. So you do have that advantage. Um, two questions, actually. One is um, beyond the cochlear is the nerve itself. So if there's any damage there, then they my understanding is you can't use a cochlear implant. And the second question, now that you're talking about all the different receptors on the implants, mm -hmm. is there a maximum number that they can turn on or turn off? Um, currently, the maximum number of electrodes that they implant is 24. And um, they don't have any, any more than that. And like I said, the way that they can map that and the way that they can allocate the sounds on that electrode array, those 22 electrodes, is amazing. And it gives you as much access as possible to the array of speech sounds on that piano keys. The, the way that the um, programming of the device works is they um, make channels with those electrodes. So they might have two of the electrodes make the S sound, for example. So right next to that, there might be two electrodes that make the F sound. And you might then have a, someone who's having difficulty differentiating those sounds. And they might have to move that second channel somewhere else so it's not, they're not getting any crossover with that. But it also means that they can, um, if one of the electrode fails, which happens frequently, I have several students on my caseload who have the odd electrodes deactivated. They can move those channels to different places. There's obviously limitations in where it goes because we know that high frequencies are in the inner cochlea. We know it, so there are limitations, but in a, the simplest form, they can move things around a lot easier. So even though it's only 24 electrodes, they have a lot of scope within that. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Did you want to answer the brain stem, the brain auditory nerve issue? Yeah, the ABI? No. Yeah. Can we? So you can get an implant, um, an auditory, uh, on, on your auditory nerve. I haven't worked with any <laughs> ABI, so I don't want to talk about them. But um, have you worked with anyone if, who's had one? If your auditory nerve isn't functioning, you wouldn't um, benefit from a cochlear implant. So they do have to take do MRIs and make sure that your auditory nerve is intact for a cochlear implant. But there are other devices that they're working on and um, I believe are just getting to be approved for pediatrics. They're called auditory brainstem implants. Um, so there's other devices and things that I'm, we're not as familiar yeah, with because they're, they're really relatively new, especially for the pediatric population. They also have hybrid cochlear implants um, where they only insert the electrode or array a certain amount. So it will only uh, hit where the essentially there's dead areas in your cochlea. So they'll insert that electrode array just in that dead area, which would give you sound in that area. Um, that's not approved for pediatrics yet either. With the way technology is going, I mean, I'm sure we'll see more possibilities for people that maybe wouldn't be official candidates for cochlear implants. 
coming up down the pathways. One thing I think that um, I'm not sure everybody is aware of, but uh, you you um, limit your chances for an MRI once you have a cochlear implant. So once you have that magnet in your head, that's no longer an option. At least that's been the case up until recently. Now I have a Medell, and they have cha channeled it down. Now and don't ask me how all this works, but you can now get a lower Tesla on an MRI to where if you have your head properly wrapped, which my surgeon did because I needed an MRI, I was able to get a low Tesla number score, whatever that equates to. Um, so it's not quite the definite no that it used to be. And I'm not sure if that would be true for AB, which is the other uh, CI manufacturer, as well as Cochlear America. Um, just on that, the MRI piece, um, the company that Francine used, Medel, are the only ones who are, have that really low rating. But if there was someone who did require an MRI, they will explant the magnet. So they won't take the whole implant out, they'll just take the magnet part out. So you would have a surgery to remove that, and an after MRI, the MRI, you would have to have a surgery to replace that. Uh, how do they connect the electrodes to the nerves? Oh, gosh. <laughs> They're not, the electrodes aren't connected to the nerves. It's just the, it's a vibration in the, the pulsing of the um, electrodes that stimulate that auditory nerve. The cochlea is connected to the... So the electrode array is inserted into the cochlea. The cochlea is connected to the nerve. Does that make sense? But the actual electrodes are not connected to the auditory nerve. They're inside the cochlea. What are they sending? They're sending it's electrical signals. They're sending electrical signals. The auditory nerve. To the, from the cochlea to the auditory nerve. There's, um, God, you're taking me back, but there's uh, fluids in there. There's perilymph and endolymph, and the electrical signal gets picked up and communicated through that fluid to the auditory nerve. Question Ooh. down front. <laughs> I've had uh, hearing loss since I was a, a baby, uh, but it was a mild hearing loss, and it's correctable. But in a recent test, something different than we've discussed here occurred. Uh, they did a test where the hearing aids uh, were adjusted so they had all the frequency response nice and flat, and I could hear any note on the piano, just about. Um, <clears throat> and then they put, uh, in a very quiet room, started speaking words to me, and then I was to repeat the word. I couldn't do it. I got about 50% of them. Is there anything that can be done for this? This wouldn't be a cochlear implant problem. This is a, this is a brain problem. <laughs> is anybody doing anything on that? Um, so I, I would recommend, if you look into the Listening and Communication Enhancement Program, LACE, that works on your processing skills. Uh, um, that will, that will kind of help build up your word discrimination. So it sounds like they were testing your word discrim. Yep. Um, did they have? Did they have the level to a comfortable level for you? you? Yes, you could put it, you could, if, you, if it wasn't right, because it's so it's perfectly normal, perfectly quiet, it's the best hearing conditions that they could set up. And they said, is this a, my voice at a comfortable volume for you? Sure. And, and you had trouble repeating back the words? Pardon? And you had trouble repeating back the words? You couldn't yeah. see their face either? Uh, no, couldn't see their face or anything, and I, I just... Some of them I couldn't, I could, that's a word, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so. And, and a lot of them I just got the wrong word. And so generally I would like to go and, you know, talk to people in, in public and say, hey, that's a, that's a neat T-shirt you have. I don't dare do that anymore because I can't understand what they say back to me. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, so I guess if you don't mind, it, do you wear hearing aids currently? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, yes, you're right. It is more of a processing. It's a brain thing. And what we say, it's a lot of what we teach the kids in school. It's, it's now that I'm back in the clinic world in the summers, when I counsel my patients, it's a lot of how I counsel the students. It's face-to-face -face communication. Oh, that helps so much. <laughs> it's slow, clear speech. You know, not talking like a robot, but the slow, clear speech. Um, and then also I do recommend to my adult patients the LACE program. You can get it online now, and it's just drills. It's like brain work. Okay. Um, and that might help build your discrim back up. 
L A C E? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll look for it. Okay, well, we're about out of time, so please join me in thanking our panel. Especially our young panelists. <laughs>